All right, ready for a wild ride. Today, we're tackling the Mongol Empire, but uh, we're going way beyond the usual barbarians on horseback narrative. Yeah, most people don't realize how much more there is to the Mongols than just brute force. Right. We've got sources. We've got an expert. Time to uncover the real story of this world-changing empire. And I mean world-changing. Literally, this empire was massive. It stretched from the Sea of Japan all the way to Eastern Europe at its peak, even parts of the Arctic. Who knew Genghis Khan had to deal with frostbite in between conquests? That's the thing, right? We always imagine these endless steps. But the Mongol Empire was incredibly diverse, from frozen tundra to, like, bustling silk road cities. And that's key to understanding how they succeeded. They weren't just conquering, they were connecting everything. On a scale never seen before, they ushered in this era called Pax Mongolica. Pax Mongolica. <laughs> Sounds pretty peaceful for an empire with such a, well, fierce reputation. So how'd this empire even begin? Was it always destined to be this massive interconnected force? Well, not exactly. It all started with this one guy, Timujin, or as we know him, Genghis Khan. But here's the catch. He wasn't born the ruler of a giant empire. He started by unifying all these different nomadic tribes. And get this, they weren't even all known as Mongols at that point. Wait, seriously, the term Mongol came later. Exactly. It became really widespread later on. But back in 1206, these different tribes, they saw Temujin's leadership, his military genius, and they proclaimed him Genghis Khan, their unifying Khan. Talk about a career-defining moment. But, I mean, to conquer that much territory, it takes more than a cool title, right? Didn't the environment play a role, too? Oh, absolutely. Around the 13th century, Central Asia went through this period of, like, unusually good environmental conditions, milder temperatures, more rainfall. And this is important. This wasn't great for humans, but for livestock, especially horses. It was a boom time. Horses. Okay, I'm seeing where this is going. Horses were like the Mongols' secret weapon. More horses meant bigger, stronger armies. Armies that could travel super long distances and just overwhelm their enemies. Like having a whole bunch of living, breathing tanks back then. No wonder they were practically unstoppable. But even with all those horses and their military skills, I got to ask, were they really as ruthless as everyone says? Well, the thing about the Mongols is they weren't just incredible strategists. They also understood how to use fear. Take the siege of Kiev in 1240. It's a chilling example. I've read about that. Wasn't there that firsthand account from a pope's envoy, Giovanni the Plano Carpini? Yes. He traveled through the ruined city just a few years later. And his description is, well, it still sends chills down your spine. Piles of skulls, bones just littering the streets. Buildings reduced to rubble. Kiev, once this driving metropolis practically wiped off the map. That's hard to even imagine that kind of devastation. Yeah. And it paints a very different picture than all this talk of interconnectedness we were just discussing. That's empires for you, right? It's this story of progress and destruction, all tangled up in the most complicated ways. Okay, so Genghis Khan unites the tribes, creates this unstoppable army, and they conquer a mind-boggling amount of territory. But empires that big, they're rarely ever truly unified, are they? You're absolutely right. And that's where things get even more interesting. See, the seeds of internal conflict, they were sown even while Genghis Khan was still alive. After he died in 1227, his successor, Ogede, he had to deal with all sorts of challenges, open rebellions, power struggles within the ruling elite. It wasn't a smooth transition of power. Let's just say that. So much for peaceful transitions of power, this struggle for control who were the major players? Well, when Ugade died in 1241, it triggered a full-blown crisis, one of the biggest clashes. It was between Batu Khan, a, you know, of Golden Horde fame. Oh, right, the Golden Horde. They were a major power, even within the Mongol Empire, right? Yeah. Based more in the West. Yeah. Yeah. They controlled this huge chunk of territory across Eastern Europe. Batu Khan, he was powerful and had his own ideas about who should be in charge. Guk, Ugade's son, he eventually became Khan in 1246, but not without pushback. Batu, claiming illness, refused to even attend the Kurultai. You know, that big Mongol council where leaders were supposed to gather. Convenient timing for an illness, wouldn't you say? Right. And it wasn't just some personal feud either. It represented this deeper tension, this power struggle that showed just how fragile this giant empire really was. So even with Genghis Khan's legacy, a strict legal code, this empire was constantly being pulled in different directions. It makes you wonder... How did it hold together as long as it did? It's a question that's puzzled historians for centuries. But after Guk's uh, short and kind of chaotic reign, a new leader came along, Munka Khan. And he brought some much-needed stability back to the empire. Munka Khan. Okay, so he doesn't get as much attention as Genghis or Kublai. What was his story? 
Munka Khan was Genghis Khan's grandson, and he was an interesting mix of like reformer and conqueror. He knew all this infighting was weakening the empire, so he focused on strengthening the central government. And importantly, he put some much needed financial reforms in place. Financial reforms. So he wasn't just about brute force. He understood a stable economy was important. Exactly. He knew the empire needed a strong foundation to survive, so he cracked down on corruption, which, let's be honest, runs rampant during times of instability. And get this, he took steps to protect civilians from abuse. Not just from nobles, even from Mongol troops. Imagine that, a Mongol leader concerned about overtaxation and plundering. Sounds like he was trying to create a more sustainable system. Less about bleeding the conquered provinces dry and more about, like, long-term stability. But I'm guessing he wasn't completely against expansion. You're right. He was still a conqueror at heart. He launched new invasions, pushed further into the Middle East, went after the Abbasid Caliphate. He also restarted campaigns against the Southern Song Dynasty in China. And those campaigns, especially in China, they had huge consequences, didn't they? Correct. But uh, that's a story for another time. Absolutely. But before we go there, I'm curious, what are your initial thoughts on Munka Khan? I find him a fascinating figure. He's definitely not the stereotypical image of a Mongol warlord, that's for sure. I mean, yeah. here's a guy who understands economics, fights corruption, even tries to protect civilians. It just goes to show that history is full of surprises and these complex figures who defy easy categorization. Well said. And speaking of complex figures who defy stereotypes... Let's talk about Kublai Khan. Okay, Kublai Khan. Now, he's a name everyone's heard of. He's the Khan who finally conquered the Southern Song Dynasty, right? Mm -hmm. Like 1279, bringing all of China under Mongol rule for the first time ever. Yeah. That's a game changer. It's incredible, isn't it? All those centuries of Chinese dynasties. And it's Kublai Khan, a Mongol ruler, who manages to do what no one else could. But it's how he chose to rule that's really fascinating. Kublai, he wasn't just a conqueror. He understood that to rule a civilization as complex as China, brute force wasn't enough. So he adapted, tried to find a balance between Mongol rule and Chinese tradition. Exactly. He took the Chinese dynastic title Yuan, which was a way of acknowledging those existing structures. And get this, he moved the Mongol capital from Karakoram in Mongolia all the way to Kanbalik, which we know today as Beijing. Wow. Moving the capital to a conquered city. That's a bold move. You'd think that would ruffle some feathers back home. Oh, it caused a huge rift. A lot of Mongols saw it as a betrayal, like Kublai was going soft, abandoning his roots, and embracing the very culture he just conquered. It's that constant push and pull, isn't it? Trying to maintain your identity while ruling this massive, diverse empire. It's a theme we see throughout history, and it never really ends neatly, does it? Exactly. But let's not forget that amidst all this political maneuvering and adapting to Chinese culture, Kublai's reign saw its fair share of, well, destruction. Conquering the Song Dynasty wasn't a bloodless affair. And those costs, they tend to get overshadowed by this narrative of a unified China. Right. Empires rarely expand without bloodshed, even the ones that are good at adapting. It's a good reminder that history is never simple. It's always shades of gray. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we've talked a lot about conquest and rule. But the Mongol Empire was more than just military power, right? There's their governance, the laws they put in place. Didn't they have this famous legal code? They did. The Yasa. Genghis Khan himself implemented it. It was the foundation of Mongol law and how they governed. And you might be surprised at how forward-thinking some of it was. Okay, I'm intrigued. Forward-thinking how? I have to admit, I'm still picturing something pretty harsh. Like, you know, you, you need something tough to keep all those conquered people in line. It was strict, for sure. It had to be. To maintain order, prevent rebellions, disobedience. That was met with swift and often brutal punishment. But here's the key. Genghis Khan knew that loyalty and competence were more important than your lineage. The Yasa, it emphasized meritocracy, especially when it came to appointing leaders. Really? So someone from a humble background could rise to a position of power in the Mongol Empire. Yes. And that was almost unheard of in other empires at that time. Genghis Khan. He recognized that to rule such a huge, diverse empire, he needed the best people. It didn't matter where they came from. This focus on merit. It was a huge factor in their success. So it wasn't just about brute force. It was also about knowing how to effectively manage a massive empire. Yeah. Were there any other surprising things in the Yasa? Stuff that we might find unexpected today. One word. Religious tolerance. Now, that is not something you usually hear about conquering empires. Why were the Mongols so open to different faiths? Well, part of it was practical. Think about it. The Mongol Empire itself, 
It was incredibly diverse right from the start. You had Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, people following all sorts of shamanic traditions, all living within the empire. Genghis Khan, he knew that trying to force one religion on everyone was just asking for trouble. It would have been constant rebellions. Yeah, that makes sense. Forcing a single religion on half the known world probably isn't the best strategy for keeping things stable. Right. And Genghis Khan, he didn't just tolerate these different religions. He went a step further. He made religious leaders exempt from paying taxes. So Buddhist monk, Christian priest, Muslim imam, didn't matter. You were tax exempt. Wow. Talk about an incentive for peaceful coexistence. So it wasn't just about avoiding conflict. There was an economic incentive for diversity built right into the system. Yeah. Did this tolerant approach last, even with all the power struggles and new cons taking over? To a surprising degree, yes. I mean, there were definitely some cases of persecution, especially when certain rulers favored one religion over another. But overall, the Mongol Empire was remarkably tolerant for its time, especially when you compare it to all the religious conflict happening in Europe during that same period. It's really quite striking. It really makes you think. We're here centuries later, and religious freedom is still something a lot of societies struggle with. And yet, these barbarians from the steppes, they created this space for religious diversity on a scale that's just mind-boggling. It really challenges our perception of the Mongols, doesn't it? It really does. It shows that they were far more complex, more adaptable, and yeah, way more tolerant than they're often given credit for. But it wasn't just about religion. The Mongols, as fierce as their reputation is, they were also patrons of the arts, sciences, literature. They encouraged this amazing exchange of knowledge across their vast empire. Okay, you've got to tell me more about this because I have to admit, I'm still mostly picturing warriors on horseback when I think about the Mongols. Mm. What kind of artistic and cultural achievements are we talking about? Well, for one, they knew how important it was to have a unified writing system. So they adopted and adapted the Uyghur script for the Mongolian language, which was a game changer. It allowed them to preserve their history, their epic poems, even all those detailed records of legal decisions, administrative stuff, they could write it all down. That's amazing. It's like creating this common language, not just spoken, but written for a whole empire. Yeah. That alone is incredible. Absolutely. And it wasn't just about preserving their own culture. They actively supported scholars and scientists from all the different cultures they encountered. The Mongols were really into astronomy. They built these impressive observatories, like the one at Tabriz in modern-day Iran. Wait, hold on. Observatories? I never would have guessed. Not exactly the first thing that comes to mind when you think Genghis Khan. You know, what were they <laughs> studying? Did they make any significant discoveries? These weren't just for show. They were centers of learning, attracting brilliant minds from across the empire and beyond. They made real progress in astronomy, mathematics, even cartography, building on knowledge from Persia, China, the Islamic world. They may have been masters of conquest, but the Mongols also understood that knowledge was valuable, and they were surprisingly good at spreading it throughout their empire. It's like this unexpected side effect of empire, isn't it? They set out to conquer land, and they ended up, even if they didn't intend to, connecting the world in a way that had a real impact. Exactly, and this interconnectedness. It had some other, less positive consequences, too. The Mongols, they helped facilitate the exchange of goods, technology, and ideas along the Silk Road, but they also, unintentionally, contributed to the spread of something far more deadly, the Black Death. Oh yeah, the Black Death. Not exactly a cheery topic, one of the deadliest pandemics ever, and it's linked to the Mongol Empire. The evidence is pretty strong. It seems like the plague started somewhere in Central Asia, and it spread rapidly along those trade routes that crisscrossed the Mongol Empire. It probably reached Europe in the 1340s, carried by trading ships sailing from Black Sea ports that the Mongols controlled. That's right. Didn't they lay siege to the city of Kaffa in Crimea and launch plague-infected corpses over the city walls with catapults? Talk about early biological warfare. That's the story. Now, it's hard to know for sure about the specifics. Historical sources from that time, they can be unreliable. Lots of exaggeration, sometimes outright lies. But whether it was intentional biological warfare or just the disease spreading through trade, the impact was devastating. Devastating is right. The Black Death, it wiped out like a third of Europe's population. It reshaped societies, destroyed economies. It left a mark on the world that took centuries to recover from. It's a sobering reminder, isn't it? As much as we can be amazed by the accomplishments of empires, all their complexities, we also have to acknowledge the truly terrible things they were responsible for. It's like this dark irony. 
Sikh's empire, it connected the world, it fostered trade, even encouraged religious tolerance in some ways. And yet, okay. it also played a role in spreading one of the worst pandemics in history. Just goes to show that history is rarely simple, full of these unintended consequences, things that have ripple effects no one could have predicted. And it makes you wonder, what will our legacy be? In our world where we're so interconnected, instant communication, global travel, what kind of impact will our actions have on the future? Will we be remembered for building bridges or for creating chaos? Those are some big questions. We could probably spend a whole other podcast talking about them. But for now, let's shift gears a bit and talk about another aspect of the Mongol Empire that we don't hear much about their influence on art and culture. Okay, so Mongol art and culture, I got to be honest, my mental image is still mostly, you know, fierce warriors, maybe some epic battle scenes. Am I totally off base here? Well, you're not wrong. Those images are definitely part of their artistic heritage, but it's the range of skills and the artistry they displayed. That's what's so fascinating. Like they were masters of metalworking. I mean, seriously, the intricate jewelry, weapons, armor, often inlaid with precious stones and metals. It's incredible. Oh, absolutely. I've seen some of those pieces in museums. Mm -hmm. The craftsmanship is unbelievable unbelievable so detailed yeah so much artistry even in something like a sword or the suit of armor you know oh exactly it wasn't just about function it was about beauty symbolism projecting power prestige and they were amazing with textiles too weaving these beautiful carpets silks they were prized possessions all across eurasia imagine like caravans loaded with these goods traveling the silk road it's like we're seeing this whole other side to the mongol empire now we talked about their military strength their government the impact they had on trade even pandemics but there's this whole vibrant cultural side, too. What about their oral traditions? Weren't they known for storytelling, poetry, all that? Absolutely. Think epic poems, songs, stories passed down for generations, often, you know, recited around a fire by a skilled storyteller. And this wasn't just entertainment. It was how they preserved their history, their values, their whole understanding of the world. And they did it all without writing it down. It makes you think about how much we've probably lost over time. So much of what we know about the past comes from written records. But what about the stories that were only told aloud? It's a great point and a good reminder that what we know about history is never the whole picture. It's always filtered through whatever sources happen to survive. We're just getting these little glimpses into something much bigger, more complicated. Speaking of glimpses, mm -hmm. before we wrap up, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You asked, what will our legacy be? And that really stuck with me, especially after exploring the legacy of the Mongol Empire. So here we are in the 21st century. What lessons can we take away from the Mongols? That's the big question, isn't it? I think even with all the brutality, the Mongol Empire teaches us a powerful lesson about how interconnected our world really is and how much our actions, even unintentional ones, can have a lasting impact. These nomadic tribes, they burst onto the world stage, they connected East and West, they brought about trade and exchange on a scale the world had never seen before. But they also contributed to these devastating pandemics and ecological disasters. It reminds us we're all part of this intricate web and our choices, our innovations, even our conflicts, they have ripple effects, they echo through time. It's almost a bit overwhelming when you think about it like that, isn't it? <laughs> our actions today, even the small ones, could have consequences for generations to come. It can feel that way, but I also think it's empowering. It means we have a responsibility, right? To learn from history, to really grasp how complex the world is, and to work towards leaving a better legacy, one that's more just, more equitable, more sustainable. That's a powerful thought. And a good one to end on as we wrap up this deep dive into the Mongol Empire. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? It really has. From conquering hordes to these really forward-thinking rulers, from cultural exchange to devastating pandemics, we covered a lot of ground. And hopefully challenged some assumptions along the way. Absolutely. To everyone listening, I hope this deep dive gave you a new perspective on the Mongol Empire, all its complexities, its contradictions, and its lasting impact on our world. And hey, maybe it even sparked some new questions, a desire to keep exploring. The past is full of mysteries, isn't it? It sure is. That's what the deep dive is all about. So until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep jiving deep.